Would you like to know what's going to happen in the future? Give me about 30 minutes and I can tell you. My name is Mike Rippey. I'm the lead pastor at Evangel and you have come across the Fire Bible Study. The Bible has a whole lot to say about what's going to happen in the future. And so I want to invite you to take about 30 minutes with me and you can know what the future is going to look like. Probably for a lot of us that are a part of this uh, Bible study tonight. Uh, I'm the lead pastor at Evangel. Uh, we have been in a study that we are calling our four core doctrines of our network of churches, which is the Assemblies of God. We've been doing it for the month of May. So if this is your first time in connecting with us, all of these are available uh, through archive, whether it's at uh, YouTube, if you're watching us that way, or if it is on the Facebook site, uh, you can go back and you can see all of these. We've also prepared for you some notes and a syllabus that will help you understand these things that we've been talking about. If you're part of the church, you can get them at the church anytime if you're just connecting with us in this Bible study. But if you're not from the River Region, you're not a part of our church, we still invite you to connect with us. We do this once a week, and it's an in-depth study of the Bible. We believe it's God's Word, and we believe it has the answers for our lives today. So I'd invite you to join with us, and we'll get you the syllabus if you'll just contact us at our website, info at evangelchurch.me, and we'll make sure that you get this information. Now, let me do a little housekeeping uh, business for those of you that are part of Fire Bible Study regularly. Last week, particularly our Facebook uh, folks, you may have not seen this thing post at the time and where you normally see it. There was a technical glitch, and somehow last week's uh, teaching, which was on healing, and I want to promise you, you want to hear that teaching, it was posted to a subgroup. So unless you were a member of that subgroup in Evangel Church, you wouldn't have seen it as soon as we could. We began to share it uh, to the main uh, pages and those kinds of things. But if you never saw it and you thought something happened that you missed it or we dropped the ball, which we kind of did a little bit, um, it is available uh, on our archives and you can go back and see that. It's the third lesson of these core doctrines that we've been going through in May. We're concluding this uh, study tonight of our four core doctrines. Remember the first three are Jesus saves, Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, and Jesus heals. So we're going to go through the fourth one here in just a moment. But the second part of our housekeeping business for tonight. Next week begins summertime. We our first study in June. And I know since you couldn't take vacations uh, last uh, summer, a lot of us, you know, were quarantined or it wasn't safe to travel. You couldn't travel, couldn't get on an airplane, couldn't, uh, you know, go uh, find hotels, couldn't uh, take a cruise, whatever you like to do uh, for family fun. Um, I think a lot of us are going to be doing that this summer. And so what I did is I prepared all the lessons for the entire summer because we're going to go through the Old Testament. You do not want to miss it because you truly can't understand the New Testament, which is who we are, New Testament believers, unless you have a great understanding of the Old Testament. Those are going to be available at Evangel this coming Sunday. It's Memorial Day weekend. Again, if you're not able to be with us, you can contact the church. We can email lessons to you. Uh, we can get them to you. Um, however it will work best for you. But they'll all be available. That way you'll have them. You don't have to worry, oh, I missed a Sunday, so I didn't get the lesson. You'll have it June, July, and August. So I've worked all the lessons, put them down on paper. They're ready to go. I haven't videoed them yet, but they're ready to go. So please take advantage of that. Pick those up. Share them with some folks that really want to understand the Old Testament. How does it apply today? Does it apply today? How important is it? It's going to be a great study as I've outlined all of these studies. I think there's 13 or 14 of them to carry us through the entirety of the summer. It is some great stuff. I love preparing it, and I'm looking forward to teaching it to you each and every Wednesday night. So uh, that's, uh, that's the business we need to take care of. Let's jump right into it tonight. Your future, my future, what does the Bible have to say about it? Well, this is the fourth of our core doctrines, those things that uh, at the very beginning, within a couple of years of our network of churches coming together, uh, the leadership met together and said, what are the things that hold us uh, like glue as one? 
because we are in different parts of the country, so there's regional differences in, in our churches, even the way we worship. There's differences in the same town with different churches, how they worship. One might be more, let's say, you know, uh, quartet country gospel. The other might be very, very contemporary. One might be more traditional. One might be, you know, right on the cutting edge. But these truths, and we began this series, if you really want to go back in our archives, the first 16 lessons of the Fire Bible Study were all on the doctrine, what we call our 16 fundamental truths. But there are four that we've highlighted in the month of May. Jesus saves, Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit, and Jesus heals. And so tonight, we're going to talk about Jesus is coming again, the rapture, the second coming. So let's ask the question as we start tonight, why study prophecy? Why do we study prophecy? Well, first reason, and some of this is not in your notes, but the first reason is simply this, and it is that prophecy proves to us the authority of God's word. Do you realize that the other great major religions and their books whatever it is, the Koran, um, the Pearl of Great Price uh, for Mormons, whatever their sacred literature is, it doesn't contain prophecy. You might say, why? Well, if they had written down prophetic things to come and they didn't happen, out of business. That, uh, that religion, that ism is done. It's over. But the Bible that we study and the Bible that we uh, allow to lead our lives and to guide us is full of prophecy. And so many of them have already come true because the Old Testament was just chock full of prophecy and Jesus fulfilled those to the letter. So the first reason is simply that it proves the authority of God's word. It's an important reason for us to look at, at prophecy. As a matter of fact, one mathematician put pen to paper, a lot smarter than yours truly, and figured out what was the probability of one individual, that being Jesus, to fulfill all of the prophecies that were spoken of him in the Old Testament, hundreds and literally thousands of years before Jesus showed up. And do you know what that was? It was one in 87, oh that's a lot, but then add 93 zeros. I, I don't even know what that number is. But that's, that's the probability of one person, which was Jesus Christ. It's another great reason to believe in Jesus. To fulfill all those prophecies that were spoken of in the Old Testament, and he did fulfill all those. One, the number 87, and then take some time, count them out. 93 zeros, 93 zeros. That's the probability. That proves that your scripture is true and accurate. Prophecy was given to reveal the power and the wisdom of God. And really, really does that. Prophecy reveals the purposes of God. And I, I'm not going to teach all this. At some point we'll look at prophecy, but these are just these are just reasons that we study prophecy. Prophecy fourth was designed by God to bring peace and assurance to believers. And I promise you it does that. Because when you read all the prophecies, when you read, like we're going to talk about tonight, what's going to happen to us in light of what is going on in the world now and what will go on in the world? Peace, peace. Wonderful peace. That's what we get from prophecy. Because we know what's going to happen. And we know where our place is in what is going to happen. The, the fifth reason is that God's great purpose in revealing prophecy to his children is to produce a holy life. It's a catalyst. It's not that it drives us by the emotion fear, but it's a catalyst for us to live a holy life. As a matter of fact, can I tell you, if you study church history throughout the ages, whenever the church has de-emphasized prophecy or for the New Testament, 2,021 years, if you would, of, of the church in the New Testament till right now, Anytime it de-emphasized prophecy, which is Jesus is coming again, that hasn't happened yet. That's prophecy that we're studying tonight. Whenever they de-emphasized holiness, the church has begun to stray from its original purpose. 
tell the entire world about Jesus, to live a life that is different than this world, to let our light shine to this world that we live in. So prophecy is extremely important. And the sixth reason is it gives that sense of urgency for the believer because we believe that Jesus could come at any time. And so my neighbors need to know and receive the love of Jesus. My family needs to know and receive the love of Jesus. That's why we study prophecy. So tonight, Jesus is coming again. What is that called? It's called the blessed hope. It's the resurrection of those that are alive. So that's what I say. It could happen, and we'd be a part of it. Like right now, before I finish this teaching. As a matter of fact, if I exit this room and that camera's still going, at the end of this, I'm going to tell you what to do if you miss the rapture, all right? So don't even worry about that. We'll help you there. But here's, here's my advice. Don't miss the rapture. Here's our actual doctrinal statement. The resurrection of those who have fallen asleep in Christ and their translation together with those. So those who have died, our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents that knew Jesus as Lord and Savior, those of us that are followers of Jesus, those that are alive and those that, as the uh, terms would have been used back over 100 years ago, fallen asleep, have died in Christ together with those who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord. It's the imminent and blessed hope of the church. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So those who have died, that's all of our family that has passed away that knew Jesus. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. So, let's take a look, an outline, if you would, of those things yet to come. The prophecy of God's Word, both Old Testament and New Testament. So much of the Old Testament was fulfilled in, in Christ, but much of the Old Testament prophecy will be fulfilled fully in Christ's second return and the end of the ages. And that's true for the New Testament too. So, what's an outline? What's going to happen next and, and then just after that? Well, can I tell you what's going to happen next is what I just read, the rapture of the church. There's nothing else that has to happen till there will be that command, that loud shout, that trumpet sound. And those that have passed away, they will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with those. That's the next event that's going to happen. And that's not to cause you to be fearful. Oh, that's a wonderful hope for us. So that's the next thing that's going to happen. The second thing is that we believers that are caught up together, there will be a couple events that take place in heaven. And that will be that we will come into Christ's presence at that time. There'll be what's called the judgment seat of Christ. That's not whether we make it to heaven or not. We've already made it. That is one of our obedience and our surrender since we've been saved. Did we do God's will? The second thing that'll take place is going to be a big party with calorie-free everything. It is going to be wonderful. And the Bible calls that the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, while that's going on up here, if you would, down here, because up here, there's, there's no time, no sense of, of, of you know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, tomorrow, next day. But down here on earth, because we've been raptured out of here, there will be seven years of tribulation going on. So you can say there'll be seven years of this judgment seat of Christ and, and the marriage supper of the Lamb, but that, that's only in terms of what's going on down here. But the tribulation will be taking place. And during those seven years, you don't want to be here on earth. And that's why at the close of this, I'm going to give you just real quick my recommendations that for some reason you're not right with Jesus and you do not make the rapture. What's going on down here is the rise of the power of the Antichrist. Who knows could be happening right now. The advent of a false prophet, someone will come on the world scene and, and just begin to prophesy what's going to happen. It will be a false prophet 
There's going to be the seal judgments, which are just horrible things going on during the tribulation. There's going to be the trumpet judgments, which ratchet it up one more time. There's going to be the appearances of the two witnesses. There's going to be the vile judgments, V-I-A-L, a vile, like you would pour out. It's judgments multiplied to a third degree. There's going to be the fall, if you would, what the scripture calls Babylon, which is just the earthly kingdoms, that one world kingdom of this world. And there's going to be the preparation for the battle of Armageddon. It's going to take place here on this planet, the war to end all wars. And then at that time, because that will begin to take place as the seven years of tribulation come to a close, then will be the second coming of Christ. See, in the blessed hope, he doesn't come and put his feet on earth. He is in the air, in the clouds, and that's where we meet him there. But then seven years later, the second coming of Christ, where he comes down, he lands in what we know as, as the Holy Land today. Satan, those that have followed him, are thrown in a bottomless pit. Then at some point, the millennial reign begins to take place after he's been thrown in that bottomless pit which is really what I like to call heaven on earth. It's the best that my mind can get around something that's just hard to comprehend. All the wonder and beauty and majesty of this planet without the sin, without the corruption, without the vice and greed, all of that. It's going to go on for a thousand years. And you know, those of us that are followers of Jesus, we're, we're going to reign with Jesus. We're going to rule with Jesus. I, I like to say I've asked for the Hawaii Isles. I'll, I'll oversee that. You, you can have whatever you want. Take, take Mississippi, take Arizona, take whatever you want. I'll take, I'll take that. If I don't get the, the, the Hawaii Isles, I, I do love the mountains of North Carolina. Just, just a little piece of that. But we're going to rule and reign for that thousand of years. And then there is going to be the great white throne judgment. Because even those that died, they're going to have an opportunity to stand before God at that judgment seat. And they will not go into a Christless eternity, which is hell, without understanding that it was a just decision based upon the choices they made in life. Then there's the new heaven and earth, and then there's eternity. So the rapture of the church is the next great event. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those that have died. He said, I want you to, because they were expecting Jesus to come back at any time. And then when some of the people in the church begin to die, they, they didn't understand it. So the Apostle Paul wrote to the church, this letter to the church at Thessalonica. And then it was shared to all the churches. He wanted them to be comforted with this bit of prophecy. So I don't want you to be ignorant, ignorant brothers and sisters, family at the church, concerning those which are asleep, which means they've died. That you sorrow not even as others that have no hope, because they've died and you think, well, they have no hope. They're not going to go to heaven because only those are alive when Jesus comes back. That was their mindset. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which are asleep in Jesus or have died in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And then the verses I read earlier, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout of voice of trumpet. So I wanted to give you those first few verses to set this up, to encourage you and to comfort you. It's the fervent belief of our church and our network of churches and most evangelical fellowships and denominations that the rapture of the church is the next event in prophecy. We say it this way. You could write this in your notes. That the rapture is imminent. It just means it could happen at any time. It's the next thing that's going to occur. Now, let me just address, since this is a Bible study that we are uh, not going to skip any questions and other ideals even concerning scripture. There are three basic beliefs regarding the timing of the rapture. There's what's known as the pre-tribulation rapture, which is really what I've just told you. 
It's what I believe. It's what our network of churches believe. And that is that the next item is not tribulation and all of those things that I outlined very quickly for you. We believe the very next thing is the rapture of the church. It, it's next. Then the pre, then the tribulation. Thus, the pre-tribulation rapture makes sense. It's just before the tribulation. There are some people that believe in the middle of the tribulation when things really get terrible. That there's a mid-trib rapture that Jesus takes his people home about halfway through the rapture. Some call this a pre-wrath rapture also. And then there are those that believe we as believers in Christ, church people, we're going to live through the whole tribulation. And Jesus doesn't come back to the very end of that. Again, I just want to emphasize, we believe in the pre-trib rapture. So let me give you some things to fill in just very quickly. The word rapture is not in your Bible. You say, well, then why do you believe it's the next event? Well, it's a word that we have taken from the Latin. There, there was a time when the church going back to what would be the Catholic Church before the Reformation. Everything was done in Latin because where the Catholic Church is from makes sense. There was even a, a Latin version of the Greek New Testament, if you would. So the Latin word from which in the Greek the term caught up comes from. Remember when I read 1 Thessalonians chapter? And those that remain, that's you and me, they're alive right now, we will be caught up. The Latin word for that is translated into English, rapture. But to get the most accurate translation of the Bible, the Bible goes back to the original or closest to the original sources, which would be the Greek. So caught up is literally what was written uh, you know, in the, in the oldest uh, text of Scripture that we have. And so thus it's translated that way as it should be into English. But over the generations, that word rapture is one that has captured the attention because it comes from, from the Latin, if you would. So, the Latin word rapto in your notes, which means caught away or caught up. This event's described here in the First Thessalonians passage I just shared in 1 Corinthians 15. And it refers to that time when Christ takes his followers from earth to meet him in the air and to be with him in heaven. It involves only those who are part of Christ. Write this word in true church. True church. There's a couple prophecies of people that think they're ready. The Lord says, I never knew you. They're not caught up in the rapture. Two are walking in the field and one is taken and one is left. He even says two are sleeping in a bed and one is taken and one is left. The one that is taken in the field and in the bed are true Christians. So again, it's a catalyst for us to live the kind of life that we should. So it's a part of Christ's true church, his faithful followers worldwide who are in a right relationship with him. Number one, just prior, there's your fill-in, just prior to the rapture, as Christ is ascending from heaven for his church, the resurrection of the dead in Christ will occur. First Thessalonians 4, 16, the Lord again will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ. Those previous versions I read were like King James. That was those that have fallen asleep. It's dead in Christ. This is not, write a big N-O-T in your notes, the same resurrection which is an event occurring after Christ's return to earth to destroy the forces of Antichrist and confine Satan to the bottomless pit. That's the second coming of Christ, and we will be returning with Christ in that great battle that is the second coming. And so Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 talks about that, that second coming. This is not that same resurrection. Next paragraph, the resurrection in Revelation 20 verse 4 that you just saw relates to those who turned to Christ and died for their faith in him during the tribulation. So they will be raptured also. Those that don't take the mark, it's going to be tough. But evidently, according to Scripture, there will be some that are not raptured, that realize what's happened. And at great, great suffering, many of them will even, even die for the cause of Christ. 
I like to say it this way. If you can't live for Christ now, how will you live for him in the rapture? Because you're probably going to die for Christ then. But those that have died for Christ during that tribulation time period, there will be a resurrection for them. So the resurrection in Revelation 24 relates to those who turned to Christ, died for their faith in him during the resurrection. Number two, at the same time as the death and dead in Christ rise, followers of Christ who are alive and on earth will be transformed, their bodies becoming, write this word down, it's a big word, imperishable. See, this body perishes. I, I get nicked and, and, and bumped and bruised. And I, I, I look like a I, I look like a banana. Right now I got a lot of bruises on my arm because th this body at 61 years of age, I can tell. It's getting older and it's going to perish at some point. This body is going to become imperishable. And so will yours. And immortal. This will happen in an instant. The Bible says in the twinkling of an eye. The word is antinome. Oh, a, a measure of time that cannot be divided. Like an atom, you know. It cannot, if you would, be divided. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, that are those that have died in Christ, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable and will be changed. We will be raised as alive and transformed, caught up, if you would, and transformed, imperishable and immortal. Number three, both the resurrected Christians and those who are instantly transformed will be caught up. That's you and me together. Write that word together. The Bible is all about togetherness. To meet Christ in the air. In the atmosphere between earth and heaven. Number four. They will be visibly united with Christ. Taken to heaven. And reunited with loved ones who have died knowing Christ. That's the, that's the first time really we'll see those uh, that have gone to eternity when we're caught up together. It's going to be an amazing, amazing experience. Number five, they will be removed from all suffering. I'll write that word in, star it. All distress, all persecution, oppression from the entire realm of sin and from death. The rapture also rescues Write that word in. Jesus' followers from the coming wrath, that great tribulation. We just believe it's in God's character. Do you remember all the way back in the Old Testament? As a matter of fact, we'll I'm study this as a picture, as a beautiful symbol. The ark, Noah's family, that great tribulation, that great wrath that was coming when God looked at the earth. He was going to wipe it out. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he was spared that rapture. That, that He was spared that wrath. This rapture is, 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 is like that ark that will take us out of here. Number six, the hope that our Savior will soon return to take us out of the world. To be with the Lord forever is the blessed hope. That's where we get that concept from. That, that phraseology of all who've entrusted their lives to Christ. It is a major source of comfort. If you knew this doctrine, pandemic didn't bother you. Whatever was going to happen, a rapture could have taken in the midst of that pandemic. While we wait for the blessed hope, Titus 2.13, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul uses we, number 7 in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, because he believed the Lord's return could happen in his own lifetime. That's why they were addressing those that had already passed away. And this same sense of urgency, write that word in your notes, and anticipation in Thessalonians, the Bible insists that Christ followers in all time periods must remain alert and ready for the Lord's return. That's that catalyst. That's that motivation. Sharing our faith. Living uh, the right way. Because Jesus could come back at any time. Number eight. Those who claim to be Christians and part of the church yet are unfaithful to Christ and do not truly have a personal saving here. Write this word down. Relationship. You can go to church all you want. 
You can work all you want. Jesus wants a relationship with you. The Father wants a relationship with you, and it's only found through Jesus. So a personal saving relationship with the Lord, they'll be left behind if you don't have that. Only a false, write that word down, system of religion and will experience God's wrath. So those that will be left behind, they will be left with only a false system of religion. There's going to be a phony religion going on when the church is taken out of here. They're going to experience God's wrath during the tribulation period. Following the rapture is the day of the Lord. That's your last fill-in. Referring to a time that brings distress and judgment to the ungodly. That's day of the Lord is another term for the great tribulation. And again, that will be followed by what some call the second stage of Christ coming. The first stage is when he takes us up in the blessed hope the rapture and it returns literally to earth at the end of the tribulation to defeat the forces of the antichrist destroy the ungodly and reign on earth for a thousand years at the end of time as we know it and then there will be a new heaven and a new earth after that thousand years so let me end with this because this is of great great comfort what if you're really not living for the Lord? Or what if you say, Pastor Mike, oh, some of my family's not, but they've heard me witness. They've, they've, they've turned down me inviting them to know Jesus or to come to church. And if, if I just vanish, they're, they're going to they're gonna look for the real answer. What hope do they have? Well, someplace on your notes, just write a few of these, these, these thoughts down. One I would simply say because... There's just a, a rash of this right now. Don't commit suicide. Don't. That is not the answer. It is not the answer. Stay calm if you've missed the rapture. It is going to be a time period of total chaos. Suicides and heart attacks and people all over the world will be in just total, total anarchy. But the fact that you lived and are remaining, even though you missed the rapture, and you're living in the tribulation period, there's nothing that can change that fact. So don't look back. Face the fact that you've been left. But there's still some hope and some things that you can do. Number one, get alone somewhere. Get a hold of a Bible. I, I'd leave a Bible clearly marked for folks that you know. Let them know it's there. If anything ever happens to me, you need some direction, just write it out very, very clearly. Because you'll still have an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So write these passages down. Look in the Bible, Revelation chapter 7 or Romans chapter 10, 9 through 11. You can still call on the name of the Lord and He will dwell with you. He will come in and forgive you. It doesn't take you out of the great tribulation but you can be saved your commitment will be challenged in the most severe severe way but you can commit your life to Christ during that time like I said you will want others that you know and love to come to Jesus give out some Bibles share with them the way to know Jesus have a Bible in a secluded place because Bibles may come hard uh, to get. Memorize the Bible. Be, beware of the world dictator. Whatever form that takes and what he has to say. Just be cautious. Don't, don't follow everything that he says. We need to be careful. We need to be cautious. Don't accept the mark of the beast. Don't accept it. And I believe they'll deceive people to try and get it. I personally would stay away from the Middle East. I just personally would. Or if anything, if they'll let you go, go join the Israeli army. Because at the end of time, as the whole world comes against Israel, which is really what the battle of Armageddon is all about, Jesus is going to come back and save that army. It may be a safer place to be, but I, 
I would not head to the Middle East to wait for Christ. I, I, I just wouldn't. Now that's, that's just your pastor talking. Stay in the Word and in the place of prayer. And know that whatever the price, eternity with Jesus is worth it. Because my advice is very, very clear. Don't miss the rapture. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 42 in your outline. Therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Listen to me. I've lived through a season of Christianity when the concept of Jesus' soon return was heightened to an incredible, incredible degree in the early 70s as the Israeli Arab boycott was taking place and all the world's attention was faced upon the Middle East for the first time in a long time. Boy, Christians begin to write about it, begin to say Jesus is coming back at any time. As we came about um, to the 80s, oh my word, they were saying Jesus was coming back at any time. When we got to 88, Oh, my word. Why? It had been 40 years since the nation of Israel was founded. And uh, there's a scripture that references about a generation. Well, they believe 40 years was a generation. A book simply titled 88 Reasons Jesus is Coming Back um, in 1988, in September, during the Feast of, of Trumpets, if you would. Oh, my. And I, I just had to call the the uh, anxiety, fears, buy-in of the church that I was pastoring at that time because uh, I think the scripture is clear that no man knows the day or hour. And you go saying it's going to be in the Feast of Trumpets 1988, then you're, you're predicting. And I just said that that's not right. And I took a lot of flack for it. I was a young preacher, very young. But I just trust God's word. Well, lo and behold, by October, Jesus had to come back. And the guy had the audacity to go back and say, I misfigured by a year and this calendar, that calendar. It's really 89. So now I've got 89 reasons Jesus is coming back and he didn't come back. 2000, oh yeah, boy, that was a big one. 2007, that was huge. Jesus is coming back. And here's what I'm afraid to ha happen to many people and some of you, some of our friends. Because Jesus didn't come back in the 70s or 1980 or 88, 89, 2000, 2007. They just don't think his return is imminent. Please don't fall for that. Don't live your life afraid. Live your life passionate and purposeful. Live today kind of in the concept of if you had 30 days to live, which is an interesting concept. What would be most important? How would you live your life? When you believe in the imminent return of Christ, you live your life in that regard. That doesn't mean we don't plan and save for the future. All those kinds, of, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying with an urgency to share the love of Jesus as the Holy Spirit gives you opportunity with a passion to serve Jesus to the best of your ability and the power of the Holy Spirit, the right way, which is a holy way, live that way for Jesus. Because the blessed hope, Jesus is coming again is the next thing on the prophetic calendar. It could happen at any time. The church used to pray, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. A lot of the church around the world prays that now because, boy, they're going through what we would say is tribulation even now. And we sometimes, in our comfort, we don't pray that like our forefathers and mothers did. It still ought to be on our heart. It ought to be our attitude. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I'm sharing your word. I'm witnessing. I'm living a whole life. I'm ready. That's my prayer for you. Well, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this time with you. If these four lessons in May, Jesus saves, baptizes in the spirit, heals, and is coming again have encouraged you, share these with a little note that just says, catch all four of these. 
to your family and friend. And remember next week, make sure you contact our church or you come uh, Sunday and pick these up, which will be Memorial Weekend, and they'll be available for a number of weeks as we begin this brand new study of the Old Testament throughout the summer. It is going to be wonderful. I can't wait to share it with you. So like uh, this uh, uh, teaching, share this teaching. Can't wait to be with you again next week. God bless. See you soon.